uh, with Tom Cook's sense of gratitude, a sense of thankfulness that he had in his heart that was very evident. And that was a real blessing uh, to me. Uh, and I thought it was very appropriate for, you know, the, a prelude to Thanksgiving that we had that uh, kind of concert. In Psalm 136, um, the psalmist simply says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Now, I'm uh, using the New King James Version. I'm glad we had another reading. Uh, I, I guess this was from the NIV. I'm not sure. Uh, but I like the way the refrain there is, sta is stated, His steadfast love endures forever. Now, in the New King James, it says, For His mercy endures forever. Uh, actually, uh, steadfast love is more, is closer to the actual uh, Hebrew word here than just mercy. Uh, and so I'm glad that, that we had that reading. Uh, so this psalm is very special. It was uh, a, what's called a liturgical psalm. Uh, where the Levites and some of the priests would lead, just like I led when I read this, and the people would sing, His steadfast love endures forever. Uh, so this is repeated. Uh, his, uh, his unending mercy, His steadfast love, it's repeated 26 times. Each verse has this refrain. I think God was trying to get something across to say that that many times. His steadfast love endures forever. So it's this liturgical psalm. Uh, the Jews refer to Psalm 136 as the great Hallel. There were other psalms that were Hallels, that is, songs of hallelujah, songs of praise, but this one was called the Great Hallel, the Great Song of Hallelujah. It was sung at the Passover feast. Um, this refrain was made uh, was uh, at the dedication of the temple in 2 Chronicles 7. You see this same refrain, his steadfast love or his mercy endures forever, uh, was sung as Jehoshaphat went to war with his enemies in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This psalm, or parts of this psalm, you can find all over the place in the Old Testament. It was one of the most probably sung or repeated psalms in all of the Psalter the 150 chapters of the psalm. Uh, there's a wonderful story of uh, Athanasius, who was the bishop of Alexandria in Egypt. You know, he was that, uh, the, the early church father uh, that stood for the Trinity, who stood against the idea uh, of, that was starting to come along that Jesus wasn't really divine. So Athanasius is one of, the, one of the great defenders of the faith. Well, he was a pastor there in Alexandria, Egypt, and this was in 358 A.D., A.D. 358, when there began to be outsiders attacking, and there were actually attacks from inside the Roman Empire, and his church was under attack. There were literally... Hordes of people outside the church shouting and throwing things, and eventually they were attacked. Uh, and it was a terrible time in Alexandria in 358. But Athanasius stood and directed the congregation while all this was going on to sing Psalm 136. His steadfast love endures forever. So there's a perspective here that this psalm gives us about thankfulness, about praise, even in the midst of 
difficulty, in the midst of hard times. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Lord, I pray as we look at this passage, as we look through it, that you would direct us and give us thankful hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I wanted to do is just go through this psalm and list the reasons that it gives for why we should give thanks. Listing the reasons for thankfulness. Because that's really what this psalm is about. It starts with thankfulness. It ends with thankfulness. Oh, give thanks, verse 1. Oh, give thanks, verse 26. And in the middle of these other verses are reasons for giving thanks to the Lord. Reason number one is what we've already said. For God's unending love. For God's enduring love. Throughout the psalm, 26 times, his mercy endures forever, or his steadfast love endures forever. This word, love, or mercy, as the New King James translates it, is the Hebrew word hased. Hased. And it literally means covenant love covenant love. That's why I say this translation is really uh, close to the meaning of it when it says his steadfast love endures forever. In other words, God does not turn his back on us and he has promised not to turn his back on us because he has covenanted with us through his son, Jesus Christ. His covenant is sure. He will not forsake us. He exercises kind, good, covenant love. And that's why it endures forever. There's one thing you can bank on. God keeps his covenant. He keeps his promises. So, that's what's being repeated no matter what's going on on the outside no matter what the difficulties may be we should be reminded that no matter how difficult it is we should never forget god's covenant love his enduring love okay that's the first one the second one he gets a little more detailed the second reason he gives, the psalmist gives in Psalm 136, is for God's match, the matchlessness of his person. Or you could say the, 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 the majesty of his person. So not only is he a covenant God who, whose love endures forever, the psalmist wants you to know a little bit about this God wants you to go a little deeper and understand who he is. So the matchlessness of his person. Look at verses 1 through 4. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. The word there for Lord uh, is the word Yahweh, which means the eternal one. Okay? For he is good. His goodness, uh, we're told in Exodus 34, 6, he abounds in goodness. His goodness is overflowing. He's the Lord, the eternal one, has unlimited goodness. Then look at verse 2. Oh, give thanks to the, here's another phrase, God of gods. God of gods. This is the word Elohim. 
Elohim of the Elohim. That literally is a word used that connects God with being the creator. He's the creator. He's the God of gods. This is one of the most used words for God in the Psalms. It's actually used 342 times of God. He's the God of gods. And then verse 3, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. There's another term for God. This is the word Adon, from which we get Adonai, which means ruler of rulers. He's the sovereign king of the universe. So he's eternal. He's good. He's the creator. And he's the ruler. Those are just some of the things that the psalmist wants us to know about God. Notice also in verse 4 it says, To him who alone does great wonders. God is the eternal one. He's the creator. He's the ruler. He's good. And he is full of wonder. Full of wonder. You know, I know some people when they encounter something mysterious that they can't figure out in the Bible, that will cause them to turn away from the Lord. And I do not understand that. Do you really want a religion that has no mystery? Do you really want a religion that has no wonder? That causes you to go, I don't understand it, but boy, it sure is wonderful. That's who God is. He is, notice it says, who alone does great wonders. And I started thinking about this idea of the wonders of God, the wonder of his, let's say, creation. Now, the psalmist here is talking about things like they saw the Red Sea parted. They saw the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. They saw the ten plagues. You know, they saw a lot of wonders. Some were tough to watch and some were magnificent. But then even beyond that, think of the creation. I mean, just think of the universe for just a minute. The wonder of the universe that God has made. 93 billion light years in diameter. We can't get our mind around that. Uh, or consider this. Did you know that scientists have calculated, I may have mentioned this before, but it's such an amazing thing, it's worth repeating. They've actually calculated that they know about how many grains of sand there are on the earth. But they've also calculated that for every grain of sand on the earth, there are 10 thousand stars think about that i mean that's <laughs> that's uh, unbelievable that's magnificent i remember actually sitting on the beach wondering one time i wonder how many grains of sand are on the earth i thought well that's a crazy question then i googled it and i actually scientists have tried to calculate it now who knows how accurate they are but they're trying but there are a lot more stars we do know than there are grains of sand God put them all there. Or what about the smallness of the universe? Have you ever thought about that? You know, you can see things just as magnificent in a, a magnificent in a microscope as you can see in a telescope. Scientists have calculated the smallest measured unit called the Planck length. And I've tried to listen and learn just how small it is, and I can't get my mind around it. Like millions of times smaller than the nucleus of an atom. Yet there's design there. God is a God of design. These are magnificent things. Listen to this statement by the great preacher C.H. Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this on this verse, verse 4. 
He said, God's works are all great in wonder, even when they are not great in size. In fact, in the minute objects of the microscope, we behold as great wonders as even the telescope can reveal. All the works of his unrivaled skill are wrought by him alone and unaided and to him therefore must be undivided honor. The God of wonder. The God of wonder. He is the Lord of lords, the God of heaven, the God of gods, the good God. So his, the matchlessness of his person is something that we can just stop and say, thank you, God. You are God. You are above us. You are great. Let us give him thanks. And then the psalmist in verses 5 through 9 focuses on creation, the God as the creator, and he gets specific about it. Look at verses 5 through 9. To him who by wisdom made the heavens by wisdom made the heavens for his mercy endures forever to him who laid out the earth above the waters uh, verse 7 to him who made great lights verse 8 the sun to rule by day verse 9 the moon and the stars to rule by night and then he gives the refrain his enduring love of his love endures forever his steadfast love endures forever so we have the making of the firmament, the heavens, uh, the laying out of the earth, separating the land from the water, verse 6. We have the establishing of the luminaries, the, month, the, the moon, the sun, and the stars. Why did God do all this? Well, one of the reasons he did it was he didn't just do it for himself. He made us in his image. He made us in his image so that we could be sustained and we could be enriched by his creation. He made this planet livable for us. He did it for us. So to me, the theme of creation, and I, I really want to stress this, the theme of creation, so when you go out and you look at the stars, you go, wow, how great God is, how powerful God is. And that's a theme. But you know, I don't think that's the most important theme of creation. I think the most important theme of creation is a demonstration of God's love. For us. That's the real theme. And that's why he talks about creation. And with every step of creation, he says his love endures forever. Because what he did in creation was not just powerful, it was loving, it was caring. So he, he, he's the creator. And he did it out of love for us. Number four, and this is a little bit of an unusual one. The psalmist thanks God for his judgments. His judgments against evil. Look at verse 10. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn. Now he didn't just strike Egypt in the firstborn. Uh, with, he struck Egypt with ten plagues. You had the blood, you had frogs, you had lice, you had flies, you had dead cattle, you had boils, you had hail, you had uh, locusts, you had darkness, then you had the death of the firstborn. Those are, those are judgments, and boy, those were I would, I'm glad I wasn't living there when that was going on. Uh, all the water turned to blood. Can you imagine? But here the psalmist says, 
His mercy endures forever. And his judgments are a sign of that mercy. Now that, that's harder for us to understand, but he mentions it here. He talks about, verse 12, the strong hand. God's hand is strong. It is a hand, it can be a hand of judgment. God hates sin and he judges sin. Uh, but it's not just his strong hand. Notice it says also, strong hand and with an outstretched arm. That's a sign of his compassion. He has a strong hand, but he has a compassionate hand. He reaches out. Uh, the Bible says, all, God says, all day long have I stretched forth my hand to a disobedient and a gainsaying people. It's not just a hand of judgment. It's a hand that reaches out in compassion. Now, he mentions Pharaoh, verse 15, another judgment. He overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. There's another judgment, but his mercy endures forever. Then he talks about two Amorite uh, kings. Well, look at verses 18 or uh, 17 uh, and following through 20. It's very interesting. To him who struck down great kings, for his mercy endures forever, and slew famous kings. For his mercy endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his mercy endures forever. Now, Bashan was a territory of the Amorites. So these are both Amorite kings. But they're repeated. You can find Sihon and Og throughout the Old Testament. They're mentioned many times. Um, First, let's look at Sihon, king of the Amorites. Now, the Amorite, uh, his, his kingdom was uh, roughly uh, just really due east of the, of the Dead Sea. And they had to go through that territory before going into Canaan land. And Sihon had, been, had not uh, given them uh, what God wanted him to give them, and so he eventually was judged and was defeated. Uh, he had been a great king. He had defeated the Moabites, which were just south of them. He was a very famous and powerful king. And then there was Og, and that was even north, uh, more up toward the Sea of Galilee, up as you get closer to what is today Syria. Uh, Og, the king of Bashan, he's mentioned 22 times in the Old Testament, and usually because of to show how God judged him. Now, Og was a was an interesting character. Um, both of these men are mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter one, where God uses their defeat to encourage the children of Israel to move forward into Canaan. Og uh, was one of the giants, in fact. He was actually, probably, scholars believe, taller than Goliath. He was of the Rephaim, or the terrible ones, which was a, 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 men of large stature. And scholars have estimated that at minimum, he was probably 10 feet tall. Now, we don't see people. Boy, he could have really done well in the NBA, maybe. Uh, the Bible says he slept on an iron bed, a special bed made for him that was 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. Uh, he was a warrior giant, and he was known as powerful and ruthless. Uh, you know, when the, the spies went in and said, we see giants, they weren't joking. They saw some giants. Now, they exaggerated and said, we're like grasshoppers in their side. That was a little bit of uh, an overstatement. 
but they were a lot of giants at that time. Remember Rahab, the harlot, who hid two spies? You should read in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 10. In fact, I'll read it right here. Listen to this. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 10, this is Rahab. She says, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So she, the, the thing that encouraged Rahab in part was the destruction of these two kings that are mentioned here in Psalm 136. So for all of this, the psalmist says, let's give praise to the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. I got to move on. Number five, another reason that's given in Psalm 136 for thanksgiving is the redemption of God's people. That's something we can be thankful for, isn't it? That he has redeemed us. Look at verses 11 and 12. He didn't just strike Egypt, verse 10. He brought out Israel from among them. He redeemed them. He redeemed them. God redeemed his people from Egypt. And with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, which is, of course, a sign of his compassion, as we mentioned. Uh, he says in verse 23, look at this compassion. He remembered us in our lowly state. You know, before we were saved, we were in a lowly state. We may not have understood how low we were. I don't think any of us really understand how sinful we really are. Uh, but we are of a lowly state. But he redeemed us out of that state. For his love endures forever. He rescued us from our enemies, verse 24. He rescued us from our enemies. So this redemption, this buying back, this rescue operation, you know, we've, uh, you know, with all that's going on in the Middle East and the uh, terrorist attacks and so forth, every once in a while you hear about a rescue. Somebody got rescued from the terrorists. Well, you know what? We've been rescued from the terror of sin and Satan. God is our rescuer. And we should give him thanks for that. Number six, he not only rescues us, he not only takes us out of Egypt, he not only destroys our enemies, he also guides us. And that's the next one. For the guidance of his hand. For the guidance of his hand. Verse 16. To him who led his people through the wilderness. Now, you know as well as I do that it did, they went through the wilderness. It took them a lot longer than it should have. They could have gone through there in a matter of weeks, but for 40 years. Their sinfulness, their rebellion at Kadesh Barnea and other places, you know, a whole generation died. God wouldn't let them go into Canaan. Even Moses in his rebellion wasn't allowed to go in. But did God stop leading him? Did he forsake them? No. He led them along. Even in their disobedience, he led them. He, the guidance of his hand, he led his people through the wilderness. And then number seven, the last of these reasons that I'll give. For the gift of his possessions. The gift of his possessions. And that kind of brings us full circle back to Thanksgiving, right? When we celebrate Thanksgiving, we, we kind of focus on his provisions, right? He's given us a great country to live in. 
He's given us sustenance. He's provided food. And we celebrate that by a feast. You know, uh, and by the way, we're here in Virginia, and you should know this. Uh, the first Thanksgiving was not in Plymouth in 1620. It's a wonderful Thanksgiving. I celebrate that Thanksgiving. But the, the, the official first Thanksgiving in America was here in Virginia, 1619. 1619. The first one in Plymouth was actually 1621, a year after they had come. So, but in Virginia, up at, uh, well, actually southeast of Richmond, uh, Charles City, uh, which was called the, the Barclay Hundred, was where the first Thanksgiving was celebrated. Now, one of the reasons we don't, maybe one of the reasons we don't celebrate it is because they didn't have a feast. They actually fasted and thanked God. So I think we, we preferred the, the Thanksgiving where we could have a, a big meal. But uh, the first Thanksgiving was in Virginia. Now, that's just a side note. I'm sorry, I'm a historian. I had to tell you that. Uh, but the gift of his possessions, the gift of his possessions, Notice, uh, after defeating Sihon and Og, it says in verse 21, and gave their land as a heritage. God took it from Sihon and Og and gave it to the children of Israel. So he gave an inheritance. He gave their land as an inheritance. And he gives sustenance, verse 25, who gives food, notice, to all flesh, not just the children of Israel. That's how good God is. He showers his blessings on people that hate him. When's the last time we've showered blessings? I'm not talking about giving blessings like you're talking about, but just, you know, done good things for people that hate us. God does that. You know, God does that all the time. He, he gives good things to people that even hate him. Now that's a magnificent love that we, we hadn't reached the bottom of that yet. God gives the gifts of his possession. He gives food to all flesh. So this number seven, what we tend to focus on. But this Psalm 136 shows us all a vast array of things about God and what we can be thankful for to him. There's a, a story that I think illustrates this very well. Uh, in Germany, in the 1630s, Germany was going through what's called the Thirty Years War. It was a horrible, horrible war. Uh, you know, Hundreds of thousands of people died uh, in this war. Lots of disease as well. Lots of starvation. It was terrible. It was some of the, if you study the Thirty Years' War, it's some of the most depressing things to study in history. But in the midst of this was a pastor, a Lutheran pastor by the name of Martin Reichardt. And he was conducting, at the height of this, in the 1630s, for a time up to 50 funerals a day. 50 funerals. Think about that. And one of them was his own, his own wife. Um, in the city that he lived in, uh, Eilenburg, Germany, there was some, some safety there where people would come. And it ended up getting over, there was an overflow of people, so it was so crowded. People trying to get away from destruction of the war, but disease started setting in in the city. All kinds of bad things happening. He brought in people to live in his home. He hardly had enough food to feed his own family, but he did his best to try to feed people. It was a horrible time. 
Yet during those darkest days in Eilenburg, Germany, Mark, Martin Reinkert wrote 66 hymns. 66 hymns. And one of them you may have heard of. Is called, Now Thank We All Our God. In the middle of this absolute destruction, he wrote this hymn. Let me read to you the words. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voice who wondrous things hath done in whom his world rejoices, who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. Oh, may this boundless, or oh, this bounteous God through all our life be near us, with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us, to keep us in his grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills of this world and in the next. All praise and thanks to God, the Father now be given, the Son and Spirit blessed, who reign in highest heaven, the one eternal God whom heaven and earth adore, for thus it was, is now, and shall be evermore. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that kind of perspective, that kind of thanksgiving doesn't just come. It's not just, it doesn't just happen. Here's a man who had a perspective from God. He understood who God was. He understood the greatness of God. And he understood that even in the midst of the worst circumstances possible, he could still give thanks to the Lord. May we take that perspective and take it into our hearts and seek to, no matter what happens to us or to our families. And this is not easy. I don't say this glibly. This is, you know, could we have, could I have done that in the middle of that? I don't know if I could. It had to be the Lord would, would have to do it. But here you see a wonderful testimony of giving thanks to God always because he is good. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the, the truth of your word. And I pray that you would help us to uh, be people of thanksgiving, people of praise, and joy to you, for you are truly worthy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.